Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study.
Another fired up Bible study in the Word of God. I want to get right to the teaching. We're starting a new series, and I want you to be excited about what we're doing. How do I know it's exciting? What if I were to tell you there is a scripture in the Bible that would put you to sleep without medication, and you would have a great night's sleep and wake up refreshed? What if I were to tell you there was a scripture in the Bible to take away all your fears? What about if I was to tell you there was another scripture, if you read it, automatically you would start laughing? Or when you're depressed, what if I told you there's a word from the Lord you can read that will help you get from that depressed moment into an exciting moment? Well, you don't want to miss this new teaching. We are actually going to start a new Bible study on the power of our favorite songs. Everybody has a favorite song. Everything I just said to you happens in the book of Psalms. Boy, this is going to be so exciting. If you can understand what God, what went into the Psalms, the creation of these Psalms, the lament, the cheer, the cry, the praise, everything went in. And many of us have found ourselves comforted by a song. Let me start here by saying, 
You got a favorite song? Do you have a favorite song? Music has a way of breaking through any kind of barrier that we have in our life. If you got a favorite song, let me give you some of my favorite songs. As you know, I haven't always been in church, and neither have you. And if you had, you probably weren't as close to the Lord as you are now. I'll be nice. But when I was growing up, there were a lot of great songs out there. And I can remember, you know, at certain periods in our life, we have a favorite song or favorite songs that we like. As a matter of fact, I'll just start when I was actually dating my wife at our wedding. I sang a song to her, which was from one of our favorite artists. We used to love Stevie Wonder. Come on, songs in the key of life. Ma Cherie or more, uh, Sir Duke. Come on, some of you know those songs. But I sang a song called Too Shy to Say. That became our song because that's the song that we sang. And I got married and I got hitched and it must have worked because we're still together. But there were all kind of favorite songs out there. And I, I want to go here so you can understand. Uh, do you have a favorite song? I want you to think about it. And if so, what's the genre? That's another thing about me. I like all genres. All, all music is just music. Uh, country and Western. Somebody said, how do you like Country and Western? Man, there are some great Country and Western songs out there. I like this song called Live Like You Were Dying by Tim McGraw. Fantastic song. You need to go listen to it. It's a powerful song. I like rock and roll. When I was growing up, there was a song that everybody was singing. I can't get no satisfaction. Come on, Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. Songs have a way of bringing us to a place. Love songs. And then there's some songs that are timeless. And the timeless songs, like, I don't know who you are, but some songs cross genres. They, they, they cross over because they're just so good that they just lighten your life and, and lift your heart. And uh, everybody knows a love song, Always and Forever. Come on, you know that song. And I remember Cal King and James Taylor, one of my favorite songs, You Got a Friend. I know I must be dating myself, but these are some favorite songs. Christian songs. Somebody said, Pastor, are you ever going to say gospel songs? I love all gospel music, Christian songs, but there's a guy out there that sang a song that really touches my heart. And his name was Keith Green. If you know anything about Keith Green's music, it is a music that is steeped in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has a song called Make My Life a Prayer for You. And I love the fact that these songs that we sing are what gives us an introduction into the songs. There are songs that everybody loves. There are timeless songs. These timeless songs that touch our soul are songs like um, Amazing Grace. You can't improve on Amazing Grace. You can't improve on what a friend we have in Jesus. So why is that important? Because in the Psalms, that's what the song, that's what the Psalms are. There were songs that were sung for worship. There were songs that were sung to lift your spirits. There were songs that were created at, an, at a time when the writer or the individual was going through a trial, was happy with life, was struggling with life, but the Psalms have a way of blessing us. And then I want to tell you, there are some favorite songs. There are. I don't know what your favorite is, but I can start naming some songs and we can all say, that's the one I run to. That's the song I go to. That's the one that blesses me. Uh, I could say Psalms 91. Everybody would start saying, he who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. I could say Psalms 34. Uh, I will bless the Lord at all times. Or Psalms 103. Uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Psalms 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Psalms 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We are going to talk about how we get power in life by studying the Psalms. I'm just, I'm just giving you a little appetizer by telling you a little bit about the Psalms, but you got to figure out what your favorite is. And these Psalms comprise the ancient hymnals of God's people. The poetry, the music, was to make sure. That's why when you read a psalm, something happens. That's why when you're in trouble, you run to the book of Psalms because they will bless you. The psalms express the emotion of the individual poet to God. 
So when you hear David saying, create in me a clean heart, we know that he had just had an episode of sinning against God in an area that hurt his heart. Have you ever been there? Have you ever sinned against God? Maybe you went back and did a sin. You said you'd never do again, and you did it again. Well, get ready to, because I believe the reason these psalms are our favorite is because the power in those psalms is universal. They touch everybody's heart. And I know that the writer, when I tell you the condition, the context, the circumstance of the psalm, you'll be able to even more reticently to be able to identify with the psalm. And also when I tell you where, uh, when I tell you how to apply or how that psalm is lifting our spirits. Different types of psalms were written to communicate different feelings and thoughts regarding the psalmist situation. I want you to write this down. Here's where the power comes from. When you read a psalm, whether you know it, what God is blessing you with, the power comes from the wisdom, the comfort, the direction, and the peace given from the psalms. If I had a church full of people here, I would ask people to start naming their favorite psalms, and I'm telling you, we may not get to the teaching because there would be tears, there would be joy, there would be, there would be, there would be worship, all because that's how powerful all the word of God is, but the psalms hold a special place. So let somebody know. We're going to be talking about the favorite psalms. I'm going to give you the insight, the author, the context, so we can see how these psalms are blessing our lives. So each psalm has a different area that it can touch. When you are persecuted, read Psalms 5. I'm not going to read it now, but I want you to read Psalms 5. You can write this down. When you feel persecuted, read Psalms 5. Uh, when you are depressed, read Psalms 6. But it looks like in all of us, I don't care how saved you are or who you are, there's times in our life when we're fighting that spirit of depression. If you're depressed, I dare you to take this Psalms just like medicine. The doctor says take a pill four times a day. Get this song, put it in your heart, read it over and over again, and watch it do good like medicine in your life. When you are joyful, read Psalms 26. What a powerful song. When I'm joyful, there's some days, uh, like everybody else, we have good days and bad days. But this teaching is right for somebody tonight because when you're joyful, don't waste that joy. You're going to have enough moments where you don't feel good. Don't waste that joyful time in your life. You need to find a place where you can shout out Psalms 26 and allow that joy of the Lord to continue to bless you. Psalms 5 for persecution. Psalms 6 for depression. Psalms 26 for joyfulness. Also, when you are sick, there's even a psalm that talks about healing. Psalms 41. When you are sick, read this psalm and watch the healing medicine of God come. Psalms 100, we all know this psalm. Uh, when you want to praise God and we make a joyful noise, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Praise will break down, tear down all kind of strongholds in your life. So there's a psalm that will give you praise. When you need protection, Psalms 91. I can tell you that there's circumstances in our life where we were so broke, where we were so uh, dealing with so much darkness that we would get together and we would read through a psalm and pray. Psalms are to be sung, they're to be read, they're to be prayed, and you can't really find a good prayer where somebody has not read a psalm. So I said, Pastor, when you go ahead and read a psalm, I know you want to get into the Word. So let me just give you a few verses, because I have to give you the background and do some teaching. But let me give you a few verses that we can look at that come out of our favorite psalms. Here we go. It's going to bless you. Let's look at a few verses. Psalms 27 and 1. How many know that is one of my favorites? It will tear down depression and fear. It says, the Lord is my light. In my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold or strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
Everybody knows that verse can cut through any kind of despair because the Lord is, and we're going to talk about that. Right now, as I said, I'm just giving you some verses from some of our favorite songs. Now, if I don't hit yours, you know, just, just uh, you can inbox me or chat to me, leave me a message to let me know I didn't get to your song. But we're going to touch many of them over the next few weeks. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is close, King James says, nah, to those who are of a broken heart and save those who are of a crushed spirit. Many a person has gone down on their knees and felt God's presence by knowing that this song says, you're not alone. If your spirit is crushed right now, God is close. If you're hurting right now, the Lord gets closer. That means that those of us who go through some jacked up times know that it's God who promised to never leave us or forsake us. We just believe that the Lord is close to us. And I don't know about you, but when is the times you felt the closest to God? When things were going wrong in your life? When things were running out in your life? You know why? Because God will not run out of your life. God will not run out on you. And as a matter of fact, when you get close to God, it's because those broken and crushed things. As a matter of fact, there was a little girl who went to visit her grandfather. And while she was at her grandfather's house, as they were sitting there, uh, this little girl loved dolls. Dolls. Every time a relative come over, she'd buy all kind of dolls. Everybody would bring this girl dolls. She had dolls that talked, dolls that walked, dolls that cooked. Well, they didn't really cook, but dolls that did everything, sat at the table. And so when the grandfather came to visit, he said, where is my granddaughter? They said, in her room. When he walked into the room, there were dolls everywhere. So the grandfather grabbed his seat and looked at his granddaughter. You know how grandparents are. We're just glad to see our grandkids. So he looked at his granddaughter and said, uh, honey, which dial, which doll do you love the best? And the grandfather said, I know she's not going to be able to tell me. So the girl looked at her grandfather and said, you're going to laugh at me. And he said, no, I won't laugh. Which one? I mean, you have all these exotic dolls. They can do all kinds of things. Which one do you love the most? And the girl went into a room, one of the closets, went deep in a bucket, in a basket, grabbed this dial, and she walked over to the grandfather. Grandfather looked at the doll. One eye was missing. Something was coming out the side. The foot was hanging. The leg was hanging. And she said, shh, don't tell anybody, but I sleep with this doll every night. He said, why? And the girl said something that I know is the reason God is with us. She said, because all the other dolls are pretty and they look good. But this doll needs me because she's broken and she's hurt. I believe that's the same kind of heart our Heavenly Father has. When we are broken and crushed to work, I know, be glad about it. Those nights when you were crying and there was no relief, and there were nights when you were hurting and there was no relief, if this word got in your spirit, the Lord is close to those of a broken heart and a crushed heart. Spirit. I love that text. And another verse to one of our favorite Psalms. Psalms 18. If you don't know Psalms 18, you ought to read it because there are some verses in Psalms 18 that will bless your heart. This is one where God, when we talk about needing some protection, uh, when all of our defenses are down, it says, the Lord, verse 2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. How powerful is that? To know that God is your place. And this is not just figuratively, but literally. God will provide a place of safety in the worst condition. How many can identify that the Lord is when you get in trouble and you need to make sure somebody stands up and you need to get strengthened? All you have to remind yourself is, hey, the Lord is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. Psalms 27, 14. I know I went to Psalms 27 twice, but this is one of the most powerful psalms in the world. This verse in that psalm, when you are actually going through and it looks like God has forgotten about you, it looks like 
things won't work. It looks like you can't hold on any longer. David said in Psalms 27, and we're going to look at that, he said, wait on the Lord. That's right, I stopped on purpose for emphasis. Wait on the Lord. Somebody out there right now, you tuned in just to get that. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That will lift your spirits, because when you're sitting there and the enemy's whispering in your ear, what are you waiting on? Nothing seems to be changing. You can tell them or you can hear David echoing in that psalm. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen thy heart. Just a couple more. Then we'll go into other teachings. Psalms 46 and 1. As a matter of fact, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm not going to start in any chronological order. I'm going to start in the order that God gives me. And I'm really being impressed upon to start with this psalm. But I'll let you know as we get there. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So we go from David saying, wait on the Lord, to us knowing we're going to wait, but we know that we don't have to wait alone because the Lord is our refuge. He's our strength, and he's our very present help in the time of trouble. Man, that's good. But let's look at how these psalms were constructed and what God wants to do, how God blessed us through the division of psalms. We're about to embark on a study that will keep your life lifted up and keep you victorious by examining the words that are in the book of psalms. So get ready, grab some pencil and paper. I want you to learn some things about how God works with people. You have a relationship with God, you'll know that there are days when God is real close, and other days you feel like, man, what have I done that God is so far away? But it's that everyday occurrence that there comes a point sometimes in your life where an anointing happens, a contact is made with God that just takes you from an earthly experience to an outer body uh, encounter with the Holy Ghost. Uh, sort of like what Moses had when Moses was in the wilderness and, you know, he was a fugitive from Egypt and he was trying to do the will of God. You know, sometimes the worst times when things happen in our life is when we're trying to do the will of God. As soon as we start doing the will of God, that's when the enemy will pop up. That's when circumstances will change. That's when the world will get dark. Matter of fact, that is when sometimes the worst thing in the world will happen to you when you're doing the will of God. You heard it here first, so you'll understand what God is doing. But look what happened to Moses. Everybody else knew that there was a fire burning up in the mountain, but Moses was chosen by God to do something that led to an encounter. He saw the fire and he said, I believe I'll turn aside and go there. What was Moses saying? Moses was doing what happens when you really connect with a word, with a direction from God. He turned aside at the unction of the Holy Spirit, and when he turned aside, he reached his destiny. Wow. What am I saying? That the word of God will bless you because the condition of the individual writer who wrote the psalm the context, his condition, what he was going through, is a universal human condition. All of us have been there. That's why the psalm will bless you. Um, I, I know someone asked me, not during this study, but they asked me, what psalm is it that will put me to sleep? I'm going to throw that in as a bonus. Read Psalms 4. God said in Psalms 4, he will give you peaceful sleep. So I said, how does that work? It works through the word of God. Psalms is a collection of lyrical poems. Psalms is one of the only two Old Testament books to identify itself as a composite work containing multiple authors. So, I know a lot of times we want to say David wrote every song, but David did not write every song. What we have to figure out now is there is a collection of writers in the Psalms. You need to figure that out because Proverbs were written. There are other people that wrote Proverbs besides Solomon, many Proverbs. But just like there were multiple authors in the Old Testament books of Proverbs and Psalms. The book 
was originally called Tehillim, which means praise songs in Hebrews. So these songs were used to be sung in the temple, in the temple of God for praise and worship. Can you imagine? I don't know what the what the uh, melody was to Psalms uh, 27, the Lord is my light, my salvation. But I believe the melody was such that it was alluring because the words themselves have the power. You know the word of God says he has set his name above his word or his word above all things. His word is what keeps us going. So his word is what has that power inherent from God. It is the word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting asunder. So the word of God, as it's sung, will lift your spirits. Look what it says. The English title that we get from Tehillim is Psalms. Uh, originated from the Septuagint Greek, the title of the psalm, also meaning songs of praise. So what is God saying? God is saying that there's something about music and singing that is divine. You know they said, uh, no matter what else you know about heaven, you know there's going to be a heavenly choir. <laughs> you know, the Bible tells us that the angels sing in the presence of God. God is the author and creator of singing, so singing can lift your spirit. If you're riding down the road and just uh, making melody in your heart, giving music to God, it can break any spirit that you're going through. So we need to understand that God touched a lot of different men, a lot of different people in Bible times to write the book of Psalms. Who wrote the Psalms? Well, let's take a look at this. David. Now we know this, but David wrote a total of 75 Psalms. Now what's important about this is 73 are in the book of Psalms. But Psalms 2 is attributed to David in Acts 4 and 25. In one of the speeches given there, one of the sermons, it says that David was the author of Psalms 2. So David had 73 that are actually in the book, chronologically in the book of Psalms, but also in other books of the Bible, two more Psalms are attributed to David. Psalms 95 is attributed to David in Hebrews 4 and 7. Now you can look those up. I'm going to leave that up for a minute so you can see David was a man after God's own heart, and David was someone who had up and down experience. I wish somebody, you know what, these folk that think they are, you know, I don't make a mistake saying, I've never met you. If you're the kind of saint that says, everything is always, I've always done everything right, I don't know who you're patterning your life after, because the Bible tells us that the greatest saints that God used also had situations where they had to pray and learn. Look what it says. Psalms 3 through 9, all written by David. 11 through 32, excuse me, 11 and 32, 3 and 9, 34 and 41, 51 and 65. These are all experiences in David's life. And we're going to look at those. So David, who sat out in the field with the sheep, was not the most popular was not the one who they voted to have most likely to succeed. As a matter of fact, when the prophet came to choose a king, David's father, Jesse, never even bought David. You know the story. Because David, they didn't know he was special. How was David special? Same way many of us get that way. Spending private time with God. Sitting down in the middle of a crisis. You know, sometimes God can't slow us down until we get in trouble. My best and most productive times with God have not come when I was going through ease. Can I get a witness? My most productive times with God came when either I messed up, uh, I was about to mess up, I was struggling with something, I was being attacked spiritually, I was in the middle of spiritual warfare, or I was dealing with some other earthly needs, you know, my money, uh, my family, some struggle. But those are the moments when God speaks to our hearts, and that's found in the Psalms. Not only David. So we're, we're going to revisit this because these are the Psalms that David wrote. But also, David wasn't the only one. Asaph and family. Asaph. 
Asaph wrote 12 psalms. I'm going to tell you who Asaph was in a moment. But Asaph wrote 12 psalms. Psalms 50, Psalms 73 through 83. Sons of Korah, they wrote 11 psalms. Psalms 42, 44, 49, 84, 85, 87 to 88. We're going to look at who the sons of Korah is. No, we're going to come back to this, so you don't have to worry. So David wrote 75, and we looked at a, out of the 150 psalms. Wow, David wrote half of them. Then we found out that another 12 was written by Asaph. Another 11 were written by the sons of Korah. And that's very important. We're going to talk about who Korah was, which you probably already know. Heman, one psalm with the sons of Korah. Psalms 88 was written by a gentleman named Heman. Solomon, you're right. Solomon who wrote the Proverbs. Solomon, we know who King Solomon was. He wrote Psalm 72 and Psalms 127. And, of course, Moses. There's several psalms that you'll look at where the Arthur name is before the psalm. And one of those examples is Moses. Is, he's the writer of Psalms 90. Now, we do know that Moses was a great author because he wrote the Pentateuch. But we know also that Moses had those kind of encounters that he also wrote a psalm. What's important about that is most of these writers, you're going to see their life <coughs> was up and down. Their life was such that they had the encounter where they could write words to God. You know what I believe? I believe, don't take me wrong, I know they were great writers, but I believe we've been in some situations in our life that if we had ever taken pen to paper when we were in those conditions and wrote the words that we were praying, I guarantee you those words would have blessed somebody else's life if we would have done that. So Psalms 90 was written by Moses. Then there was, our last writer was Ethan the Ezraite. Ethan the Ezraite, he wrote one Psalms, Psalms 89. Now, let's do a little background so we understand who these writers were, which will give us a better understanding of how they wrote the Psalms. So we have, there are actually 48 Psalms in the Bible that were written anonymously. We don't know who the authors are, um, but the Psalms are, they're, they're, they're powerful Psalms, and we're going to study a couple of them in our favorite Psalm study. So who were these writers? Let's look at them. So we, I just showed you eight different writers, including a conglomerate of those who wrote the anonymous Psalms. But the sons of Korah, Korah is best known for his rebellion against Moses in Numbers chapter 16. You know the story. That, that's the Korah we're talking about. Dathan, Korah, and Abihu, they all came in and said, Moses, you're not the only one that God has anointed. And they got up and decided that they were going to put on the ephod and the priestly clothes and challenge Moses. And all of a sudden, God came down and Moses told everybody in the camp, look, uh, you need to make sure you know whose side you're on. And as they were going through this, they were praying. The next morning, God said, get out of the way. And he took Korah, Dathan, and Abiah, and they swallowed them up in the ground. God said, I had chosen Moses, and they rebelled against authority. The story is way deeper than I'm saying. I'm just trying to get to the psalm. You need to know that Korah was not a great person. He did have a lineage from the sons of Levi. But if you look, Korah's sons did not follow his legacy. Nevertheless, even though Korah and the rebels died that day, Korah's lineage continued until we encounter the sons or descendants of Korah who authorized who authored many songs. If you go to Numbers 26 and 11, write that scripture down, you'll find out that there were uh, Korah's uh, descendants. So what we're saying is it wasn't his actual sons, but it was, there were descendants that came down his lineage. And in biblical times, they were called, called the sons 
of whoever the father was. So Korah and his descendants, there were sons of Korah. And the reason I'm starting with them is because we're going to find out that a couple more of the writers we talked about were the sons of Korah. Isn't it something that when somebody said, you're going to be just like your daddy, that don't have to be true. If your daddy was a scoundrel, you don't have to be a scoundrel. There is power, there is something with genetics and the blood, but how many know the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus Christ, trumps the blood that I'm given naturally. I have a destiny from God. Ooh, I feel like preaching right now. Let me stay into my study, because what I need you to understand is, don't let anybody call you short because of your shortcomings and your downfalls. You don't have to be what somebody else is because that person, you break free when you get saved. That's why the Bible says, any man being Christ, he becomes a brand new creation. I wish you look around your house. I wish you look around your family. And if anybody has been prophesying and telling you you'll never be anything because somebody else wasn't anything, do not believe them. You now have a heavenly family. You are a child of God. You can rejoice that you are a son or daughter of God. So we have proof in scripture that his father was rebellious, but the sons came down and began to work through the generations with God's plan. You'll find out that these sons of Korah, they could not have written the words that they wrote if they were not anointed and they were not certified and sanctioned by God. Set apart and sanctioned by God. So we know now the sons of Korah, yep, they came from that rebellious Korah who was destroyed in the wilderness on the way to the promised land with those Israelites who, you know, found themselves double-toned and not following God. The scripture in the Bible says stiff neck. I never knew what stiff neck was. I had a stiff neck, but I never knew what it meant. I guess they were saying these are folk who just were set in their ways and would not listen to God. Three descendants of Korah's line, watch this, that's why I started with the sons of Korah, go on to become great musical masters and pen the songs. So, the sons of Korah were Heman. Remember, he wrote one of the songs. He was a son of Korah. Asaph. And we're going to talk about Asaph because we know more about we know more about Asaph. For Asaph wrote more than some of our minor prophets. We know more about the life of Asaph because of the longevity of his serving in the temple and because of his love for David and his love for God. We know Asaph and why his script, why his songs were so powerful. And then there was Ethan. Ethan. All of these were the sons of Korah, and all of them were writers or musical masters. Now understand, that meant that they played instruments, they wrote songs, and they led the choirs in the temple because of who they were. As a matter of fact, Asaph, which I'm going to look at next, was actually David's director of music. He was David's musical director. Um, Heman was a grandson of Samuel. He penned Psalms 88 and was known for his wisdom. There is a scripture that tells us that Heman was known for his wisdom because he was actually writing during the time of Solomon. Um, Ethan, or Jedathan, is another, his name is spelled differently in scripture. Another one of David's chief musicians also served as a prophet like Asaph. He was, Asaph and Heman served as choral directors of the Psalms, which would have been accompanied by music. So here are Three men who God touched their heart and wrote words that are still touching us now. And the one who wrote the most is Asaph. Asaph is recognized as David's musical director and probably wrote much of the original now lost music for David's songs. That's another thing you understand. We, we have, when the Bible was actually placed together and it was decided which books were, you know, which books needed to be within the text of scripture. When that was written in, in the Bible, we found out that the Psalms were placed in as words after, you know, so period of time. So a lot of the music that went with the Psalms were lost. So when the scripture was canonized and all the books that were felt to be inspired were placed in, we found out that he wrote 12 Psalms, but he probably wrote all the music for all the David Psalms. We know the times of Asaph lived. That's why I said we know more about Asaph. Look at this. 
from 1020 to 920 BC, from David's reign through Solomon and Rehoboam, we know he lived in Jerusalem. We know his family. We know what happened to him. His songs are songs of strong lament. His songs are songs of strong connection to God because of the fact that we know that Asaph was a man who loved God. Matter of fact, he had his heart broken after watching the reign of David and Solomon, which were the united kingdom, he saw God's plan fall apart with Rehoboam and Jeroboam and how the children of Israel just turned from God. And the scripture lets us know that Asaph died with really a broken heart after seeing the way people did God. If you're a person who really loves God, you get upset internally and externally when you see people who just and I'll put it in our modern vernacular, just dog God. He blesses you and you dog him out. You don't, you're not grateful. Uh, you don't worship. You get to the point where you say you're the author of your success and everything you got is yours. Until you get in trouble, you really ignore God. And that's what Asaph was feeling. Also, we know that the work he worked as director of music uh, at David's tent meeting. That's something David had tent meetings and at Solomon's temple. We also know a great deal about his personal and family life, which I just expound to you. King Solomon, son of David. Solomon was the third and last king of the United Kingdom. We know that, right? Saul, David, Solomon. And following King Saul and King David, he was the son of David and Bathsheba. Now we do know that Solomon is another one that had a shaky beginning. And I'm sorry to say a very sad ending because even though he was the wisest man, he allowed his heart to be turned from God by the women that he was with. Be careful that you don't let something turn your heart from God. Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes, and much of the book of Proverbs. Solomon reigned for 40 years as king. So these are the writers of the Psalms, and you can see that there is a lot of um, a lot of story and a lot of reality of ups and downs in their life. Moses, we know Moses' story. I mean, Moses is one of the most prominent figures in the Old Testament. God specifically chose Moses to lead the Israelites from captivity into Egypt and to the salvation into the promised land. What's great about Moses, Moses is recognized as a mediator of the Old Covenant. Uh, is commonly referred to as a giver of the law. And finally, he wrote the first five books of the Bible. So, we know that these writers, and the reason when you read Psalms, that's what you have, have some background. So we get to it, and we start studying these Psalms, you'll understand how powerful they are. Ethan, the Ezraite, Ethan, the Ezraite, is the songwriter, author of Psalms 89. The title of the song says it is a maskil of the Ethan. So it means that it is one that is enjoined for temple worship. Let's go into it. In addition, 89, Psalm 89 is mentioned in Kings 4, 31. Can you write that down? In Psalm in Kings, 1 Kings 4, 31, it tells us that he was a wise man. Matter of fact, the scripture said he wasn't as wise as Solomon, but he was a wise man. The Psalms comprised an uh, ancient hymnal of God's people. The poetry was often set to music, but not always. The Psalms expressed the emotion of the individual poet to God. Can I stop there for a minute? If you are going through a attack of conscience, um, a period of weakness, Feel like you're going astray and losing God. Do what the psalmist did. Each one of them had that emotional connection with God until they were at a place where their life was blessed. Different types of psalms are written to communicate different feelings and thoughts regarding a psalmist situation. So I want you to get this, right? What are the different types of psalms? Psalms of lament. Lament expresses the authors crying out to God in difficult circumstances. So, a psalm of lament eases the pain, eases the grief 
by crying out to God, he then sends down the appropriate anointing that helps you cope with the struggle that you're going through. One of the best things God ever made was crying. Did you know tears are cleansing? Did you know when you're sitting there crying, if you're the kind of person you never cry, you got too grown to cry, too old to cry, too hard to cry, I don't know if your heart can be touched. I remember my, my children and I were watching movies together when they were younger, and I would always try to hide my face if I was crying. I'm going to tell you something. Some of those cartoons would make you cry. And I remember crying on The Lion King. And Simba was going through stuff, didn't know who his dad was. I know somebody's laughing at me, but I was sitting there drying tears in, in Lion King. I remember watching this movie um, called The... Um, Oh, what was it called? The Poets, Dead Poets Society. Oh, one of my favorite movies with Robin Williams. And there was a place where the whole school was about to kick Robin Williams out because of his unorthodox way of teaching. And at the end, they had all these rules and regulations, but his students stuck with him. And as they were about to fire him, when he walked into the room, they all stood up on their desks and recited one of the poems that were forbidden that he had taught them. And they just said, my captain, oh captain. And even the, the boy in the class who was the he was the, he was the most afraid, he got up. Man, it sent chills down my spine when you stand up for somebody. I know I deviated, but I'm just telling you that the men crying is a cleansing part of God. Go somewhere and have a good cry. It might break that enemy off of your back. Psalms 3 is a, is a psalm of the men. Psalms 24. 20, 44 verses 23 and 24 are Psalms of Lament, where the author was writing through tears. That's why it blesses us when we read it. Psalms of Praise, also called hymns, portray the author's offering of direct admiration to God. Psalms 8. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Psalms 8 just wants us to worship and praise God. Thanksgiving psalms usually reflect the artist's gratitude for personal deliverance and provision. Can I have Thanksgiving psalms? Oh yeah. Um, let me go back. Thanksgiving psalms. You can think of a psalm of Thanksgiving. Oh, that men would praise the Lord and, uh, and thank Him for His wonderful gifts to the children of men. Psalm 107. There's psalms where God is just directing us to give thanksgiving to God. Um, pilgrim psalms include the title song of ascent. Um, we were used as pilgrimage going up to Jerusalem for the three annual feasts. So whenever they went to Jerusalem, there were certain psalms that they would sing, and they were called pilgrim psalms. And they were psalms that rehearsed their track through the wilderness, their blessing of God getting to the promised land. They were powerful psalms. Psalms 30. Psalms 32, Psalms 34 are pilgrim psalms. Other types of psalms are referred to today. Wisdom psalms. Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalms can give us wisdom and direction for our life. Psalms 37 is also a wisdom psalm. Delight thyself in the Lord and he will give thee the desires of your heart. Just a verse out of Psalms. Victory Psalms, Law Psalms, Songs of Zion. All of these are divisions of the Psalms. And we can look at these and see why Psalms were so important. Hymns. Many of the Psalms are simple hymn songs of praise. For example, Psalms 8 is a hymn that begins, Lord, our Lord, how excellent, let's go back, is thy name. Let's just stop typing because I know. And the next one is lament or complaint psalms. These include songs that express sadness to God, to complaints against God's and our enemies. For example, Psalms 3 is a lament. Psalms that begin, Lord, how many of my foes, how many rise up against you? All right, so I'm going to be closed in a few minutes. So let's close with reading a psalm to close this out. Next week, we'll come back and we'll start in on looking at the context and the blessing that comes from the psalm. Now, I told you I was inclined, 
So let me read in your hearing, get a word in you before we leave tonight. I want you to go with me to Psalms 46. Psalms 46. What a powerful psalm. Not long, but I want you to take this in as we close this and as you remember the power that comes from psalms. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth does change, and though the mountains be shaken into the heart of the seas, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains tremble with the swelling, there is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Now listen to the music as you can imagine them walking into the temple as I read the rest of the song. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in half. He burns the chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Till next week, read through the Psalms and get ready to know why these Psalms are the favorite because many a life has been lifted from the doldrums of pain and deceit and hurt and depression just by reading a Psalm. The Lord is our refuge. Father God, we thank you tonight for your word. We're glad that we can read your word and find a place of safety, find a place of joy, restored. God, right now, touch the hearts of the people listening. Let them know that your word was written so that we might have peace, direction, wisdom, and a place where we felt we could touch you. So God, I thank you tonight for the study in Psalms in Jesus' name. And just in case you're not saved, pray these words with me. Say, Lord God, I'm glad you've given me time to choose you as my Savior. I believe you died on the cross in my place, rose again, with all power in your hand. I believe it. I confess it. And I am saved. Come on, say that now. I am saved. Thank you. You enjoyed our lesson tonight. Just kind of hit us up on Facebook. Let us know you're listening. But also, if you receive the Lord tonight, go to our website, Shiloh Baptist Churches www.shallowbaptistchurches.org Go to our website and there you will find a lot about the ministry but you also can become a member of our church virtually. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying until next week, be blessed of the Lord. God bless you.